Hello, and welcome to the Future of Work podcast by allwork.space. My name is Ceci Amador de San Jose, and today I'm looking forward to chatting with Phil Simon. He is an award-winning author of 11 books, most recently Reimagining Collaboration. Phil, welcome. Hey, Ceci. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, for everyone listening, we're going to be focusing on remote collaboration in the post-COVID workplace. So I'm going to start right with this. And it's a lot of surveys have found that workers want to go back to the office specifically because they miss in-person collaboration. Your book is all about reimagining collaboration so that we can better collaborate in a remote world. So why do you think people want to go back to the office to collaborate if, I mean, the technology is available for us to collaborate online? Sure. In a nutshell, at least from the surveys that I've seen, people want to go back, but only two or three days a week. In fact, a fairly high percentage of people will quit their jobs, they say, <laughs> if they have yeah. to return five days a week. No one wants to go back to five days a week, 90-minute commute each way. Uh, getting to your question, even though the collaboration tools that are described in the book, you know, Slack, Zoom, Microsoft Teams as hubs, and then I'm sure we'll talk about the spokes later on, are, are certainly more advanced than they were even five years ago. Um, there still are things that I would argue are better suited for an in-person type of arrangement. And we see this with some companies saying that they're going to be retiring the term office and be building <laughs> satellite centers, right? In which people will collaborate. They'll specifically go there to brainstorm or for a performance review or for you know, employee orientation. Um, those are the types of things that don't necessarily lend themselves, if possible, to a strictly digital world. Ditto for things like collisions. I mean, there are apps like Donut. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. No. That you can install in Slack or I think it's in Teams as well. It's tough to keep track. There's so many tools that effectively simulate a random collision. So if you work in finance and I work in marketing, right, we might run into each other in the elevator yeah. in the real world but maybe not so much on one of these collaboration hubs. But those tools are, are better than nothing, and they've come a long way, but they can't necessarily replicate the experience of running into someone in the hallway or seeing someone wearing a shirt, and all of a sudden you make a connection. Um, so yeah, uh, the point is, though, that uh, yes, remote work is important, and maybe that goes down a bit from its current highs, but are plenty of people that don't want to return and we're trying to figure out how we're going to work with this new type of technology um, and to me this book is less about remote work and this particular trend and more about um, a whole new way of working which i'm sure we'll talk about oh yeah we will um i have to say while i was reading uh your book there were so many things that you we're talking about, I'm like, well, that kind of sounds like me a little bit and not necessarily in the good sense. Um, so, for, so like one of them was um, using, like making the switch from one platform to the other. And we recently made that switch and it wasn't easy. I mean, I got so used to reading my emails in one platform and then, and this happened to someone else that I work with. Um, the delete button in the new platform is like right where I would usually click to open it. So it's been a lot of delete and then no undo, undo, go search them in the trash. And so I, I can see why and we'll talk about this a little bit later on why people are so reluctant sometimes to embrace new platforms, which brings me to kind of my next point, which is what are in your experience, the top three things that prevent people from effectively collaborating remotely, hybridly, whatever you want to call it. Before I answer that, Ceci, you were just switching from one email client well, or no. service to another. No. Yeah, well, I mean, email included, but then a bunch of other stuff as well. But Oh, okay. Yeah. Because if you think about it, um, you know, we do get used to working in a certain way and yes. you know about why people hate change it's it's tough right people are busy people have a lot going on in general much less when there's a pandemic when say <laughs> you know your kids aren't in school or you have to take care of a loved one or you know all these things are happening so people get used to working a certain way and you know look at our smartphones by some estimates we touch our smartphones 150 times per day 
Oh, right. Okay. That doesn't mean that if we're iOS, we can't learn Android or vice versa. It just it's going to take a while and you know we get stuck. Um, I'd also say that in many instances, companies have been reluctant to invest in truly collaborative technology. They say, well, if we're just going to use Teams as email, then who cares? Uh, <laughs> when in fact, there are some big differences there. In fact, when the yeah. pandemic broke, and I wrote about this in the book, there were lots of companies that did immediately move towards implementing new collaboration tech, but move towards employee surveillance tech. Oh, yeah. Um, Don't get me and there started are, on that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, it's understandable, and especially if you pay attention to the news these days, ransomware and, and hacking and bad actors, I mean, yeah. we weren't really set up to work from home. And most, uh, I shouldn't say most, but quite a few people don't really do much when it comes to home security. And yeah. you don't have to be a black hat to break into their networks, but that's a whole discussion. Uh, in many instances, um, answering your question as well, you've got senior executives who set terrible examples. Right, they say we need to collaborate more, right? Okay, and yes, we should all be using Microsoft Teams, but then they use email for cr for critical communication, right? And that sets an example that trickles down to the other layers of the organization that you know these other tools are optional. So you know these tools are around and they're better, but if you know, your CEO or CXO is using email, then that is really the default mechanism of communicating and most people aren't going to tell the person running the company hey you're doing it wrong so i, I do want people with this book to have like you said a, a an uncomfortable reaction saying oh yeah we, yeah we do that here uh we can do a lot better and I'm, I'm hopeful that this book will force people to think about the way that they're working and also legacy business processes there are lots of examples in the book about how people created a business process 20 years ago. And even though the technology has drastically changed, the way that they do something, you know, whether it's payroll or publishing content, hasn't remained the same. So by definition, you are trying to implement a new tool, but it's not as far reaching or powerful as it could be. And yeah. there's a chapter in the book about business process that I really hope people will read and say, hmm, it's been 15 years. Is there a way for us to maybe, uh, do this in a better, more efficient, more automated way, one that's got fewer choke points, one that's got less of a chance for error. So uh, this is a very holistic book, and I'm yeah. hoping that people will read it and you know, really think about what they're doing and, and hopefully ask some key questions. Yeah, speaking about change and some people resisting change, and you mentioned this a little bit in the book, um, what should companies do? Obviously, if it's kind of the owner, the CEO or whatever, it's not like they can just say, oh, yeah, you can just go ahead and walk away. But if you have um, specific employees, uh, what do you suggest companies do if they're refusing to start using or fully adopting technology collaboration platforms? Yeah, I've been wrestling, Ceci, with aversion to change for 20 years um, in different capacities. So I've seen yeah. this movie many times before. And ideally you start with the carrot, right? You say, look, there are a lot of benefits to using hubs and spokes and embracing the model that I advance in the book. You'll spend less time searching for documents. You'll customize your notifications. Um, you'll get better context around your message. You'll be less overwhelmed. With one click of a button, you can have an actual conversation with someone versus going back and forth with asynchronous messages. Um, so uh, the carrots tend to be better or say to someone, look, you know, appeal to their vanity, right? You got this, yeah. right? Slack is really just a souped up version of a tool that's probably older than UIR, IRC, Internet uh, Relay Chat, if I got that acronym straight. Or if you're using Zoom um, and you don't like it, say, well, it's kind of like Skype, but it's better. So appeal to their vanity. Um, and if they're not willing to play ball, then I do think it's time to then bring out the sticks and say to them, look, we need you to collaborate using this tool, right? Every time you send an yeah. email, you derail the conversation, you, you lessen the power of these networks. And, and let's make no mistake here, uh, these collaboration hubs benefit from network effects, just like Twitter, just like Facebook, just like Google, right? And yeah. I know when I lived in Las Vegas, I talked to a startup founder and it was 2014 or so. And I was working on my book about communication, message not received. 
And I got into a discussion with a founder of a startup who said, yeah, we had to let somebody go because we used insert name of collaboration tool and they just wouldn't use it. So yeah. I think the fundamental recognition, Sessie, is that these tools should not be optional. And, and no, using Slack or Teams or Zoom or Google Workspace or Workplace by Facebook or whatever does not obviate sending email, right? <laughs> but in, internally, why would you go back and forth with a bunch of email? It doesn't make any sense. And there's a whole chapter on email that I rant on, but oh, I'll yeah. shut up them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you know it's funny because as you, when I was reading that, I was um, going through our emails, and you mentioned several times we should use this, and I'm like, well, I already have email, so eh, I mean, yeah, guilty. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like people, I mean, no one likes change. Um, that much is clear, but I do think that it's important, especially now that you see a lot of companies saying that one of the top skills that they're looking for in candidates is the ability to collaborate and communicate effectively. And so it would naturally follow that if you have one or two people that are not collaborating with the tools and platforms available, and that's hindering the process and the progress of everyone else, then, I mean, it, I wouldn't be too surprised if, they're, if they are let go. And then you've talked a little yeah. bit about... Go ahead. Yeah, if I could just jump in here. You think about the word collaborate. In chapter two of the book, I define collaboration against a number of adjacent terms. Right? Yeah. And I'm very persnickety when it comes to terms. I think that a lot of times we get off on the wrong foot because we're not talking about the same thing. Right. Whereas uh, productivity is getting something done, right? You can be yeah. individually very productive. Collaboration, yeah. by definition, means getting something done with other people. So you yeah. can't just say, I like email, therefore I will use email. You're working with other people. Yeah. And those other people need to have some skin in the game. So yeah. it, it gets tricky because in the past, there are a couple examples that towards the back half of the book in which I explain some of the own, some of my own challenges I've had communicating with people over the years or collaborating with people. And sometimes you never are on the same page and it doesn't end well especially when you have all these tools out there, right? You could say, well, I want to use StreamYard, right? Well, I want to use Zoom or I want to use WebEx and then nobody wants to back down. So what do you do? Okay, so that's another thing. There are so many options available. How you can't expect everyone. I mean, you have employees and you have freelancers and contractors and then people that just come in and out for specific projects. And how, how can companies decide what's which platforms to use because it, it's overwhelming i mean i love that we have options today but then that makes it decision making you know analysis paralysis and it just, how what are some things that companies should keep in mind when they're evaluating a platform or a hub or a spoke lots of things but to your point before i answer the question decision fatigue is a real thing uh, there's no coincidence that i think about two Weeks ago, Netflix introduced Play It Now, which, if, which effectively was their attempt to eliminate that. And by hitting a button, it would find something good for you to watch because people yeah. got overwhelmed. And I'm not on Netflix now, but I have been many times over my life. And you know, sometimes you spend an hour trying to find the perfect show and you get yeah. frustrated. In fact, um, Barry Schwartz wrote a really good book and references a great study. I forget the name of the book off the top of my head, but um, and he's written a couple. But how in a famous experiment at a mall maybe 20 years ago, I think it was in the United States, they put out, I think it was 20 different types of jam. And they said to people, <laughs> please um, try the jam and buy whatever one you liked. And it was something like 10% of people bought jam. But then they reduced that to about, I think it was six. Do you know what percentage of people wind up buying? It was something like 40 or 50, if memory okay. serves me correct, because people didn't want to make the wrong choice. If you <laughs> minimize the number of choices, then they felt better and more confident about their decision. Now, against that backdrop, let me answer your question. There are lots of factors, but here's one. Many people use Microsoft Office 365 or Office 365. They keep rebranding it. And as yeah. part of that suite of tools, Microsoft includes Teams. And if your company doesn't want to pay for Slack, and it's understandable, um, yeah. there is a free version, but some companies don't want to write that check, um, then your decision's made for you. In some instances, yeah. you already are using a hub, but you don't know it. Many companies, think something like 300 million people use Zoom um, 
on a regular basis. Well, Zoom, and I know this from writing for Zoom for Dummies, is so much more than video. Zoom has channels and the ability to share files and install apps. So you could say- I didn't know already, that until I read your book. <laughs> a lot of people don't. Um, in fact, uh, one of my theories about while well, Slack for Dummies is selling reasonably well, but a lot of the reviews have said, there's so much stuff in here I don't need. It's because if you're just <laughs> using it for video, then yeah, you don't need 400 pages. Yeah. But there is, and that actually, along with writing Slack for Dummies, was sort of the genesis of writing this book. I knew that there was a bigger message that was getting lost in the Dummies books. Um, other times, Sassy, to answer your question, a particular feature may drive paying for a tool. For example, um, Slack used to call them shared channels. Now it's called Slack Connect. Effectively, it's a private yeah. pipeline that connects your workspace to my workspace. And don't get me wrong, uh, Microsoft is currently working on that and it's only a matter of time if all these companies basically steal from each other. But one of the examples that I like to use is, is that if you work at the University of Guadalajara and I work at the University of Arizona, we set up basically a tunnel between our two workspaces. Um, but, but you're right, there is a lot of fatigue. And again, people don't know the power of these tools. Let's say that you're applying for a job at my company. I don't have to do it over email. I can invite you as a guest in Teams, in Zoom, in Slack, and that's how we can communicate, right? Yeah. That's how you could upload a resume. That's how you could fill out a form. So um, hopefully the book provides um, some guidance around that. Um, yeah. And I'll be the first to say that uh, another factor would be the number of spokes to which the hubs can connect. It's yeah. never been easier to connect them. Um, I know Zoom is kind of trailing when it comes to that, but they just crossed a thousand third party apps. I think it was last yeah. month. So there are a lot of factors involved. And then, okay, so you're, you're talking about how there's a lot, it's easier now than ever to integrate different spokes. Do you think there's such a thing as too many spokes for one, like for one team to use? Do you think like, is there such as too much, like the less, the better? Or do you think yeah. that having the options unlimited? Yeah. That's a tough question to answer because <laughs> and just in case we haven't touched on it, um, one of these collaboration hubs, Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, in and of itself is very powerful. But those yeah. tools, Ceci, don't obviate the need for us to use project management tools like Asana or yeah. Trello or content yeah. management systems like WordPress or ERP systems or CRM systems like Salesforce. So it's great that you have this choice, but I'm a big believer in picking a lane, right? If we use Asana to manage our project throughout the organization, it largely yeah. does the same things that Trello does, right? If you use yeah. um, Oracle as your ERP, then why are you using Workday? So it's great that there's this choice, but the short answer is yes. Uh, things can get very confusing if people are using multiple polling apps. I know for Slack, you've got Simple Poll, you've got Poly, right? Yeah. And some people might say, oh, I couldn't figure out Poly. Well, that's because you're used to using Simple Poll. So again, it's great to have this choice, but um, it's important to pick a lane and, and stick with it. Okay, and then going back to, um people not knowing the full capacity that a hub or a spoke offers. Do you think that's one of the main reasons why sometimes collaboration hubs fail to deliver? Or oh, do you absolutely. think there's something else behind that? Well, I mean, systems fail for all sorts of reasons, Ceci. We talked earlier about change management and people being stubborn and executive not being involved and clinging to antiquated business processes. Yeah. But you're right, um, you know, people often conflate email with Microsoft Teams. And yes, you can send text messages in Microsoft Teams and attachments, but um, to borrow a joke that I like from the comedian Gary Goleman, that's kind of like saying that my phone uh, lets me make phone calls. That is absolutely true, <laughs> <laughs> but it does a few things more or uh, is part yeah. of the same joke. He says, I've got a Lexus convertible and it holds my coffee. Right. Well, it does a little bit more than holds your coffee. And I do think that this book um, illustrates the power of these collaboration hubs, particularly tied to spokes. And my hope is that it will spark a conversation uh, among people who read it. that There's so much more that they can do here. 
And hopefully they'll look back in two or three years and say, wow, I'm glad that we did this because towards the end of the book, I talk about the future of collaboration. Some of the things we're going to be able to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the sooner that you get on board with using hubs and spokes, all things being equal, the better off you'll be. And then in your book, you mentioned that a big part of getting employees motivated and familiarized with um, these hubs and spokes is to provide training. In your experience, do companies do offer that training or is that something that they just kind of like say, okay, so here's the new platform, go ahead and start playing with it, have fun? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see some data on this. And there certainly are companies that will put people through training. But my sense is that people say, go online, find something, you know, here's a webinar. In fact, a fun story, after the book came out, a company reached out to me to do some training and they wanted to cover in one hour. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Zoom, Microsoft Teams, um, I think it was OneNote and then how computers okay. work. All okay. four of those things in an hour, right? And then yeah. when I said, that's not really feasible unless you really want to talk super fast, um, I said, you know, that's just not going to work. And then the response came back from the executive. Oh, we'll just let them do it on their own or we'll buy a few copies of his book. This was a healthcare organization. If you think that a bunch of nurses in a pandemic working 12 hours a day are then going to come home and read my book and process it, yeah. Um, I, I don't think you're 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 a sane individual. So uh, unfortunately, I think people do put the onus on employees to pick this up, and as a result, they get some of the same reactions that I got from you earlier. Oh, I didn't know that Zoom could do this, and a lot of people said that, or a lot of people say that about Slack or Teams. So hopefully, again, this book will make them ask questions about the true power of these tools, and hopefully, use more of them because right now it's really just the tip of the iceberg. And then moving on to a different subject. In the book, you talk about the importance of trust for effective collaboration. And a lot of people that are collaborating remotely are people that are, well, in some cases, a lot of teams, a lot of companies are fully embracing remote work, allowing people to work from anywhere. And that will increase the number of people that are working together from different countries, for di from different cultures. So how do you build trust what are some suge suggestions that you might have um, to help employees build trust with each other if you want to account for cultural differences and how you build trust and time zone differences? It just, I feel like it just complicates matters a whole lot. Absolutely. There's a sidebar in the book from a friend of mine, Jason Horowitz, who's done a lot of traveling and software development with different teams. In fact, in the, in the sidebar in the book, he mentioned how there, was, there were coders in Belarus trying to work with a company based in Manhattan. And the company in Manhattan would frequently call for meetings at noon, which was something like 5 a.m. in Belarus yeah. time, which you know most people aren't <laughs> awake, much less cogent. No. Um, I mean, I tried to write a holistic book and I'm no expert on, on organizational trust, but hopefully people will get to know themselves and others a little bit better using these tools. Because again, you would never send an email with an emoji. You would never send an email with animated GIF or GIF, depending on how you want to pronounce it. But in Slack or Teams or Zoom, that's very easy to do. And in fact, because it's a little less formal, right? Imagine if um, you say something and I find it amusing and I put in an animated GIF of, I don't know, a Schitt's Creek or a take in the movie or something. Oh, I didn't know you liked that movie. Um, again, that might seem like a silly example. But you know, there are ways, I think, to make things less formal using these yeah. hubs. And if things are less formal, then we're going to be friendly. If we're going to be friendly, hopefully we trust each other. <laughs> you know, that's funny because um, a few years back, um, I was asked to please use emojis and gifts and stuff like that in my instant messages because people were complaining that I was too short and curt. And I'm like, well, I mean, I'm just saying yes, no, okay. Like, so now I'm. Um, Nicholas, yes, smiley face, happy face. Uh, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that because I remember giving a talk back when people gave talks in Austin, Texas in 2015, and someone asked me the question about using emojis. And I said to myself, well, what's the context? Because if you and I have known each other for two years, right, yeah. and I put in an emoji, that's a lot different than if the CEO sends me a message and my response is an emoji for. <laughs> 
first impressions, <laughs> right, I might always be emoji person. Um, but as I researched Slack for dummies, I realized that emojis were actually really useful, especially ones with a particular meaning, like say, looking into it with the eyes. I love okay. that because imagine sending a message with, I'm looking into it versus if you post it in a channel and you see four people with the eyes that they're looking into it, so you, you know that, right? You don't have to send someone a message. So I've actually done a 180 on emojis. And yes, there's a time and a place, but I think they can be in the right context, very valuable. And of course, all of these hubs and spokes support them. Okay. And then, so this is like a direct quote from your book. It says that reimagining collaboration requires more than just using new tools. It also requires adopting a new mindset. And this reminded yeah, me. Smart. I'm gonna buy that book. <laughs> and this reminded me of a conversation I had with Tony Saldana a few years back. Um, he does a lot of digital transformation talks and talks a lot about future of work. And he says that one of the main reasons why digital transformation efforts fail within companies is company culture. And so, what are some tips that you can give? to companies and to employees so that they encourage and they nurture a company culture that creates an open mindset that encourages people to explore new stuff. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, so I'd start off by hiring well, and that's okay. easier to do when you're a startup or a small company. In fact, um, in the book, I describe three different types of fields. You've got greenfield, right? So nothing's okay. ever grown there before. It's fairly yeah. easy all things considered, hire well, build technology uh, and collaboration into the culture. And then you've got a brownfield, right? So you might have um, a larger company that's tried some things before, but you know has struggled as, as a lot of companies do. And then you have a black field, a company that's just totally dysfunctional. Basically, nothing will grow there. Uh, avoid being a black field if at all possible, but you know, hiring well, um, you know, I, again, you can do things like that through Slack, through Teams. If someone says, oh, I'm super collaborative. Okay, great. We're going to do this hiring process over Zoom or Teams, and we're going to make you a guest. So no email. And the person says, oh, no, I only use email. Well, there you go, <laughs> right? Well, you still might yeah. hire that person, but you that, you that person has effectively shown you a particularly valuable piece of data. Um, because if you ask the person that question, are you collaborative? What are you supposed to say? So, um, you know, and then, uh, I mean, hiring isn't the only thing, but in the book, I mentioned things like performance reviews, right? Performance management. Companies will say collaboration is really important, but then really, if you're collaborative, but you only sell $100,000 worth of widgets, you're probably going to get rated lower than if you're not collaborative or, you know, yeah. you're a jerk, but you sell a million dollars worth of widgets. So. Yeah. Um, and this is a holistic book in my own career. I know sometimes people have called me out not being collaborative uh, because when you said you had to be curt on some messages that resonated with me because a couple of times on projects, we were way behind schedule, way over budget. And people said, you're so direct folks. And I said, <laughs> I, I understand that, but we don't have time, right? We were yeah. supposed to be live on the system six months ago. So, um, you know, hopefully the organization looks at performance management and views collaboration not just as nice to have, but as essential. And Netflix is a great example of this. Reed Hastings famously said, we don't hire um, ta or talented jerks, right? So if someone <laughs> is really talented in whatever capacity, but just isn't collaborative, you have to ask yourself, is that person really worth having? Especially to your point with remote work, the labor pool is so much bigger, yeah. right? If you're comfortable with remote work, you're not limited to the people who are in your 50 mile radius. You might find someone who lives at the other side of the country and say, you know, we're just going to pay that person once a month to fly out here or once a quarter. Yeah. So we're running out of time a little bit. So to close off our conversation, where do you see the future of collaboration going in the post COVID workplace as more people start going back to the office, even if in a limited basis, where do you see the use of these hubs and spokes going? They're only going to increase since the book has come out. Microsoft has announced project Viva, which is basically their name for what I'll call hubs and spokes. Salesforce announced plans to acquire, I think it was in early December of last year, 
um, Slack for $28 billion. They're not going to do that if they don't believe in the future of hubs. Yeah. Zoom announced, I mentioned that they had crossed, I think it was a thousand apps. Citrix bought REC, the project management tool for $2 billion, which is a phenomenal amount. Uh, brass tacks, SE, hubs and spokes aren't going anywhere. They're only going to be more powerful. And the advice I give to my, my clients and when I talk to people, yep, this is going to happen whether you like it or not. And the sooner you embrace it, the better off you'll be. Perfect. So thank you so much, Phil, for joining us today. Uh, if people want to look you up and find out more about you and your books, where can they find you? PhilSimon.com. Perfect. So thank you again so much for chatting with us. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the Future of Work podcast by allwork.space.